Theodore Arult Dodges. 1890 work, Alexander. 4. Early Greek Armies and War. Every Greek citizen was a soldier and trained as such. In Homeric times, the great warriors fought in chariots, the lesser ones on foot. There was no cavalry. Distinct organization is traceable as far back as the times of the Seven against Thebes. Tactics is observable in the Trojan War. The siege of Troy was a mere blockade, though its walls were very poor, for there were small knowledge of the means of siege. Religion, education, and public games combined to maintain the honor of the warrior's life. He was on duty from eighteen to sixty years of age, and only through arms could political preferment be reached. The phalanx was the main reliance of the Greeks. Light troops were insignificant, cavalry poor. Chariots disappeared after the Trojan War. Battles were uniformly in parallel order, and decided as a rule by one shock. The Greek armies were very nimble, but sieges were long drawn out. Command was divided, much to the loss of directness. The men were not paid. Booty replaced emoluments. Rewards were mere marks of honor. Punishments outward marks of disgrace. Sparta was noted for the severity of its discipline and the simplicity of its habits, but lacked the broad intelligence requisite to continued success in war. The infantry was perfect, the cavalry worthless. The kings, though in command, were subject to the whims of civil officials, known as ephors. The Spartans had no idea of strategy, though they practiced ruse. Peace to the soldier was incessant labor and deprivation to prepare his body for war. He went to war as to a feast, decked with flowers and singing hymns of joy. The Athenian citizen was equally bound and bred to arms. From eighteen to forty, he must serve anywhere from forty to sixty, be prepared to fall in to resist invasion. The phalanx was the chief reliance as in Sparta. The Athenian soldier was more fiery, less constant than the Spartan. Few early wars call for any notice. The Mycenaean wars were noteworthy on account of the able defense made against the Spartans, and the marked skill of Euphaeus and Aristomenes. Not Sparta's skill or courage but her excess of strength subdued the Mycenaeans. The ancient Greeks borrowed the germs of all they knew of the art of war from the East, but with true national intelligence they rejected the useless and improved the vulnerable. Uh, sorry. The ancient Greeks borrowed the germs of all they knew of the art of war from the East, but with true national intelligence they rejected the useless and improved the valuable up to its highest utility for the conditions of their age. The early kings of Greece held both the civil and military power. Every freeman was a soldier and was trained as such from his youth up. Bronze weapons were already familiar to the Greeks at the time of the Trojan War. The nobles and chiefs used thrusting pike, casting lance, and sword, and let missile weapons, bows, and slings to the less brave or expert. The Trojan chiefs did not disdain bows. Helmets, breastplates, and large shields were likewise made of bronze. Fighting on foot and in chariots, 
the latter was the prerogative of the great, were the usual methods. There was no cavalry for the hilly character of Greece, except Thessaly and Boeotia, was unsuited to its evolutions, and neither, as a rule, were the horses good, nor the men of Greece used to riding. The constant employment of chariots is all the more curious. From these two or four horse two-wheeled vehicles, the warrior descended to fight, the driver, meanwhile, remaining near at hand. At best they were cumbrous and of doubtful value, except as a moral stimulant. In the tradition of the seven against Thebes, to assert Polynices' claim as king, there are some traces of organization suggested. The city was besieged by posting a separate detachment opposite each of its gates, and by relying on hunger as an ally. But the Thebans made a sortie, slew the seven kings, and drove their forces away. Ten years later, the sons of the kings captured Thebes and placed Polynices, son upon the throne. At the siege of Troy, 1193 to 1184 BC, we find clear evidences of organization. Agamemnon, evidently, had the legal power to compel the reluctant Greek monarchs to join him in the, an expedition based on a mere personal quarrel. Achilles had 2,500 men divided into five regiments of 500 men each. The Greeks advanced to battle in a phalanx, or deep body, shield to shield, and in silence, so that the orders of the leaders might be heard. But in front of the lines of the armies, there always took place a series of duels between the doughtiest champions as it were a prolonged and very important combat of skirmishers before the closing of the heavy lines. But coupled with an admirable idea of discipline was the habit of plundering the slain, for which purpose ranks would be broken and often a decisive advantage lost. Prisoners were treated with awful inhumanity. Camps were regular and often fortified. The men used no tents, but camped in the open building huts, if long in one place. At Troy, the Greek camp had a broad and deep ditch, palisades, or a wall made of the earth thrown up from the ditch, and wooden towers on the wall. Behind this, the army camped in huts. Fortification had advanced but little beyond the roughest work. The art of sieges was all but unknown. The ten years' blockade of Troy amply shows the latter fact, as the constant fighting outside the town proves that little reliance was placed on the value of its walls by the Trojans. The Greeks did not surround the city, but sat down on the sea coast before it had and blockaded it, some hundred thousand strong. Troy was able to ration itself from the Mount Ida region. The Greeks were sadly put to it for victuals, and were compelled to detail half the army to the Chersonesus in order to raise breadstuffs. For nine years there was not but insignificant small war. After the Greeks had wasted their time in isolated attacks on the Trojan territory, until both sides were well nigh exhausted, Nestor counseled concentration and the division of the army into bodies of ra by race and families in order to produce a spirit of rivalry and due ambition. It is evident that the troops knew how to deploy, for they filled out the gates of their camps and then formed line of battle. The army had a right center and left. The infantry stood in several ranks. In front, the least brave, in the rear, the most brave, on the plan suggested by Nestor. And the army was marshaled on occasion in several lines, as, for instance, the chariots in first, and the foot in second line. 
To attack the Greek entrenchments, Hector divided the Trojans into five troops, so that success should not depend on one attack alone. Here is the crude idea of a reserve, as it were. Aristides names Palamedes, who was at Troy, as the inventor of tactics. But Nestor must evidently share the honor. The one thing which interfered with the successful use of tactics was the prolonged dueling part of the fray between the heroes of both sides. Of art in their warfare there was barely a trace. It was only in the tenth year, after heavy fighting, that Troy was taken, and it was without a siege in the sense we understand it. From the time of the Trojan War till the 6th century BC, the Grecian states made gradual advances in military organization. The warriors was the highest duty in the state, as well as the precious privilege of the freemen. Religion, education, and public games combined to train the youth to war. Religion taught that heroes became demigods. Education was almost entirely confined to athletic and warlike exercises. Training in patience and endurance. The incalculation... No. Religion taught that heroes became demigods. Education was almost entirely confined to athletic and warlike exercises. Training in patience and endurance the inculcation of respect for superiors and elders, and the love of country. Public games afforded the bravest, strongest, and most expert an occasion of exhibiting their skill and prowess, and of earning honor and repute. Chariot and horse races and athletic games monopolized these ceremonies. The latter comprised running, leaping, obstacles, wrestling, throwing the lance, and discus, boxing, the pancratium, or boxing and wrestling mixed, and the pentathlium, or an exercise combining all the others. The prizes were, as a rule, mere evidences of honor, but these were held to be far beyond material reward. A noted victor had statues erected, inscriptions cut, and hymns sung in his honor and was often maintained at the public expense. The right and duty of war existed from the 18th to the 60th year, varying somewhat in different states. When war occurred, a draft of the requisite number was made by lot, or route, or age. A given number of years' honorable service yielded a citizen many privileges, and opened to him every civil office. Warriors, crippled in battle, were cared for by the state, and highly honored. About the 6th century BC, the Greeks fought almost exclusively on foot. The hoplites, or phalangites, were the heavy, the phasiloi, the light, infantry. The former came from the best classes, and were armed with pikes up to ten feet long, short swords and large shields, and wore both helmet and breastplate pla and wore both helmet and breastplate and sometimes greaves. The breastplate was often of leather, and everything being provided by each hoplite for himself made the arms and equipments as various as the tastes of the individuals. The pisaloi had no defensive armor, and carried only bows and slings. Recruited from the poorer classes, they were of far less value in action than the hoplites, but some pisaloi, like the Cretan bowmen, were celebrated for their accurate aim and the penetration of their arrows. Chariots fell into disuse after the Trojan War. They were found to be unavailable among the rugged hills and vales of Greece. But cavalry began to take their place. At just what period is uncertain. Xenophon mentions cavalry in the time of Lycurgus, 
It was undoubtedly employed in the Messenian War a century later. As an arm, it was not good, excepting possibly the Boeotian horse, and especially that from Thessaly, on whose broad meadows had been bred an excellent race of stout, serviceable cobs. The tactical disposition of troops was very various, but generally, in earliest times, was based on a decimal system like that of the East. The light troops covered the front and flanks of the army, and the hoplites were formed in a dense body, uniformly called a phalanx, which, however, at that time, had no absolute rule of formation or numbers. Xenophon states that the unit of the then phalanx was a taxis, or locos, or sentry, of one hundred men, commanded by a captain, and ranged in four files, twenty-four men deep, plus four officers, each file having four sections of six men each, ten taxis, made a chilarchia. Ten taxis made a chiliarchia under the chiliarch, and four chiliarchias a phalanx. The names of the units of service were very various. Attacks were made in parallel order, but it was infrequently sought to lean the flanks and rear on obstacles which might prevent their being turned. Camps were pitched where they were secure from the nature of their location and were rarely much fortified. The soldier carried no great burden, and the Greek armies were very nimble. The right flank was the post of honor. Marches were almost invariably by the right, and the flanks of the common of march were covered by the pisiloi. Engineering, as applied to fortification and sieges, still remained singularly crude. The later were wont to be the of long duration. They scarcely amounted even to blockades. Ithome was besieged eight years, Ira eleven, Crisa nine. To the government, whatever it might be, was entrusted the care of all things pertaining to the military establishment but the right to declare war and to make treaties was reserved by the people which expressed itself in public gatherings. The weak feature of the Greek military organization was the lack of unity of command. The armies were, as a rule, commanded alternately for a given period, often but a day, by one of several leaders elected by the people who jointly made a council of war and who were apt to be under the control of other non-military officials sent by the government to watch them. This system very naturally arose from the history and tendencies towards literally. This system was very naturally arose. One more time. This system very naturally arose from the history and tendencies towards liberty of the various states, but was coupled with very difficult problems and often resulted in disaster. The Greek served his country without pay. To receive money for a duty was in early days considered an indignity. Plunder, however, made up for this lack of remuneration. After a victory, the booty was collected. Part was vowed to the gods and placed in their temples, and the rest was divided according to rank and merit, the leaders being usually entitled to the lion's share. Punishment for military crimes involved loss of honor, sometimes of civil rights, the penalties most dreaded by the patriotic Greek. Rewards were embodied in an increased share of plunder promotion, gifts of weapons, and marks of honor, and in civil advancement or public support. 
The Greek soldier was a curious mixture of virtues and vices. He possessed courage, discipline, and self-abnegating patriotism in the highest measure, but was prejudiced, superstitious, and monstrously cruel. The Greek states were characterized by similar tendencies. The individual merely reflected the state in petto. Sparta. Among all the Greek states, Sparta in the 9th century BC and Athens in the 6th were distinguished for the perfection of their military organization. The main object of the laws of Lycurgus, 820 BC, was to form a military power out of a mass of free citizens and to impress on the individual soldier those qualities of courage, endurance, obedience, and skill, which would make him irresistible. This they did by banishing arts and sciences. This they did by banishing arts and sciences, civilization almost, and by reducing life down to its lowest limits of simplicity and self-denial. This method fully accomplished its aim. Soldiers have rarely, perhaps never been, animated by so single a martial spirit as the Spartans. Love of country and willingness to sacrifice to itself and all which lends life worth has never been more fully exemplified than in the pass of Thermopylae. But what was gained in one sense was lost in another. A state cannot become great in its best sense by its soldierly qualities and achievements alone. The Spartan youth belonged not to the parent but to the state. They were educated in common and drilled in gymnastics and the use of arms from earliest childhood. They were compelled to undergo extraordinary fatigues, and this on slender rations, and were taught the simpler virtues of respect for age and obedience to superiors. From twenty to sixty all men were under arms. War was to them the only art, death in battle the highest good. As a consequence, the Spartan army for centuries was considered invincible. But Sparta's success in war led her into too frequent wars, and her disregard for the arts and sciences advanced her fucking... <clears throat> Excuse me. But Sparta's success in war led her into too frequent wars, and her disregard of the arts and sciences advanced other nations beyond her in the intellectual grasp of war. Sparta was forbidden by Lycurgus to possess either fortress or fleet. The army alone must suffice as breastwork of the land. Still, more curiously, the army was prohibited from pursuing a beaten enemy. Not conquest, but defense of the fatherland was sought. Such mistaken policy eventually gave Sparta's opponents the upper hand. Heavy infantry was the main reliance of Sparta. The soldier wore full armor. He held it a duty to the state to preserve intact his body for the state, but he did not seek safety by the method of Hudibras. He deemed it dishonor to lose or fight without his shield. Not to have it with him implied that in his haste to run away he had cast it aside so as to run faster. He bore a heavy pike, generally a lighter lance, and a short double-edged sword. There was little light infantry, and the cavalry was mediocre. It was formed in eight ranks and generally got beaten. There is some conflict of statement between Xenophon and Thucydides as to the organization of the Spartan troops 
into bodies. This is probably due to the changes in such organization from time to time. But rank and command were well settled. In a mora, or regiment of 400, and later of 900 men, Thucydides says 512 men were one polemarch, or colonel. Four lohagoi, or majors. Eight pentecosteroi, or captains. And sixteen eno motarkoi, or lieutenants. It had four lokoi, divided into sections of twenty-five and fifty men, each under a sort of sergeant. The word locos, like taxis, or like our word division is often applied to various bodies. Each mora had added to it a body of one hundred horsemen or less. The kings were the commanders in chief. In peace, their power was limited. It was unlimited in war. But they were strictly accountable to the people for their use of the army. If there were two armies, each king commanded one. If but one, the people decided who should command and who remain at the head of the home government. In the field, the king had a species of staff and bodyguard consisting of one or two polemarchs. Several of the victors at the public games and a number of younger mounted warriors. Later, the kings were accompanied by the ephors, of whom there were five, who acted as a species of council of war. These ephors were civil officials, whose duty was to watch lest the kings should exceed their legal powers. The Spartans knew nothing of strategy. Their tactics was simple. They moved out to meet the enemy, drew up in a deep, heavy phalanx, and decided the day by one stout blow. If the enemy was superior in numbers, they sometimes tried ruse. They marched to battle in cadenced step and in silence to the sound of the flute. If they won, they might not pursue. If beaten, they were generally able to withdraw slowly and in good order. A mounted vanguard accompanied the army on the march. In camp, they had a police guard under a provost marshal, and they appear to have developed a system of pickets and patrols. They rarely fortified their camp, which was round in shape, if they could place it where it, its location made it reasonably secure. Peace to the Spartans was a season of unremitting labor in preparing for war. War was their sole relaxation. The only duty then was to fight. The intervals between marches and battles were filled by games and gymnastic sports. They had none of the task of peace. A campaign was a holiday. All fatigue duties were performed by helots who accompanied the army for that purpose only. They were in latter years utilized in the ranks of fighting men. They carried abundant supplies on pack animals and the general meal in peace a most coarse though ample mess was in war rich and nutritious. The soldiers prepared for battle as for a feast wore their best garments and plucked flowers wherewith to adorn their persons and their arms. The Spartans never opened a campaign before the full moon. This was a religious custom, but occasionally, as at Marathon, far from auspicious. The gods were propitiated by tiresome and invariable ceremonials and offerings before every military movement. Being allowed by law no fortresses, the Spartan territory 
was not only open to invasion, but the nation was ignorant of fortification, nor did they understand how to lay siege to a strong place. Athens from the abolition of the kings down to the days of Solon, 1068 to 594 BC, owing to the internal discords and external conflicts of Athens, the war establishment was uncertain. Solon's laws aimed at producing a form of government which should keep the aristocratic elements within bounds and at the same time not run into pure democracy. He divided the citizens into four classes, or phyli, according to wealth. The pentakos eomedimnoi, spelt p a sorry, spelt p e n t a k o s i o m e d i m n O I. The Hippias, or Knights, the Zugatoi, and the Thetes. The first were the richest, the last the poorest. Every citizen was bound to service. Though Athens was a democracy, the citizens were often in a small minority. There were at one time, but 90,000 of them to 45,000 foreigners and 360,000 slaves. Another census taken under Demetrius showed 21,000 citizens, 10,000 medics, and 400,000 slaves. The members of the first two classes above named were obliged on requisition to keep each a horse and serve as cavalry. But were they free from infantry duty in all but exceptional cases? The third class furnished the heavy infantry in which each man must supply himself with arms. Of the fourth class, those who could furnish the poorer arms might serve in the heavy foot. The others were the light troops. Every Athenian freeman was held to pursue a certain gymnastic and military training in the public schools. At 18 years of age, he took a solemn oath to fealty to the state and entered upon the military duties. From 20 to 40, he was bound to serve whenever drawn within or beyond the Attic territory. After twenty years' service, the citizen was discharged and entered upon civil pursuits, but up to his sixtieth year he must be ready at all times to fall into the ranks to resist invasion. Towards the end of the sixth century BC, the classes were increased to ten. The heavy infantry was the strong arm of Athens, as of Sparta. The hoplite still bore the Homeric arms, consisting of large shield, long lance, and short sword. The Homeric armor remained substantially the same among the Greeks ever after. The warrior wore a tunic. He first put on his greaves, then his cuirass in two parts, the mitre underneath, the zone above. Then he hung his sword on the left side in the socket of a belt which went over the right shoulder. He next assumed his shield hung in similar manner, then his helmet, then his spears. The hoplite fought in closed phalanx, eight or more deep. The cavalry was weak, the light troops, pisoli, insignificant. The army was apt to be set up in one or two lines, 
with the heavy foot in the center, the light foot in the wings, and the cavalry on the flanks. But this was not invariable. The organization of the troops at this time is not accurately known. It appears to have been made much the same as the Spartan, the names merely differing. Each of the ten phalli furnished a body of 1,000 or more hoplites under command of the chiliarch or colonel. The phalli selected each a commander called strategos, who was the equivalent of the Spartan polymarch. Of the ten strategos, each, in turn, took command of the entire army. Altogether, they constituted the council of war. The Athenian was equally brave, more fiery in his courage, but less constant and enduring than the Spartan, and the discipline to which he was subjected was somewhat less strict, as accorded with the national character. Wars. Immediately after the Trojan War came the invasions of the Heraclidae, 1104 BC, who subjugated the Peloponnesus. Except these, the wars of the Greeks down to 750 BC, where much what the quarrels of small semi civilized tribes are wont to bring about, i.e., wars quite without system. When Sparta and Athens had grown to be substantial nations, military movements came to be more noticeable, but they were still mostly confined to small war and sieges. The territory of Greece, cut up by natural and political divisions into limited domains, narrowed operations down to this species of warfare. Larger evolutions were out of the question. But small war was conducted with much intelligence. Sieges were more properly blockades. Fortification relied upon situation rather than art. The first Mycenaean War, 743 to 724 BC, is worthy of note, for nothing so much as the long and excellent defense against the Spartans by Euphaeus, king of Messenia, his maintaining himself in his capital during five years of preparation for war, his holding his own against the so-called invincible Spartans in the bloody but undecided battle of Amphia, and the defense of Ithome, mark Euphaeus as a great man. At Ithome, in a rocky fastness for eight years, Euphaeus kept the best troops of the Spartans at bay, and in the last year beat them in the second battle at Amphia, but at the cost of his own life. At this battle of Amphia, 730 BC, Euphaeus showed a fine conception of battle tactics. The Spartan kings Theopompus and Polydorus met the Messenian array in parallel order. The contest was severe. The right wing of each army was defeated. It was anybody's victory. But Euphaeus snatched it by a masterly stroke conceived on the instant and in the turmoil of battle. The cavalry on his left had defeated the Spartans in their front and driven them off the field, speedily recalling them from pursuit, always a difficult thing to do. Euphaeus led them behind his line of battle over to the succor of his retiring right. Thus supported, the right was enabled to rally, and a few bold charges by the Messenian horse decided the day. Euphaeus did not profit by the victory. He fell in his moment of triumph. Aristodemus, 
who succeeded him, kept up a constant small war for five years in which he maintained his superiority and finally again beat the Spartans at Ithome, this time so badly that only the excellent discipline of the latter enabled them to regain Laconia with the relics of their army. But the Spartans, with abundant population and resources, could easily recover themselves, while the Messenians were totally exhausted by their gallant struggle. On the day, on the death of Aristodemus, the Spartans were able to take advantage of their superior strength and reduce Messenia to a tributary condition. The Second Messenian War, 645 to 628 BC, was illustrated by the valor and ability of Aristomenes, under whose leadership the Messenians again rose to cast off the yoke of Sparta, invaded Laconia, beat their oppressors so badly as almost to recover their lost liberties, and devastated large parts of the Spartan territory. After two years of disaster, the Spartans were more successful, and by taking advantage of the treachery of their allies, gained a marked advantage over the Messenians. Aristomenes required Aristomenes retired to Ira, a fortress which he could victual from the nearby sea, for Sparta had no fleet. The same conditions had existed at Ithome. In Ira, for eleven years, Aristomenes held himself against the Spartans by able diversions outside the walls and staunch defense within. These long sieges exhibit, as nothing else does, the lack of engineering facilities of the day. But finally, the Spartans, again by treachery, gained entrance into the fortress. Aristomenes, Aristomenes was allowed to withdraw, but Messenia was subdued and parceled out by the Spartans.